I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is the October 17th Transportation and Parking Commission meeting. Um, I'm going to announce that we are being audio and video recorded. And um, as we always do, we're going to go around and do introductions. I'll start with myself. I'm Jean Louise Shara. I'm the Ward 4 City Councilor. I'm normally the Vice Chair, but our Chair, Councilor O'Donnell, is unavailable today, so I am chairing. And Dave Palmer is Director of Central Services. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Hartwell, Citizen. Alan Verson, I'm the new person, the planning board representative. Well, I just want to mention I have to leave no later than 5.30 to pick up my grandson. Okay. Welcome. Jody Casper, Police Chief. Krista Granat, Citizen. Rich Cooper, Citizen. Donald Scalia, DPW Director. Jamie Fisher, Citizen. Maggie Chan, DPW. Yes, Forrestal, Assistant City Collector. Yep. Yep. DPW. Um, and next we'll call for public comment. If the item that you're here to speak on is on the agenda later on, feel free to just wait until that time. But if there's anyone here who wants to talk about something that's not on the agenda, please feel free. No? Okay. Um, so the next item is the approval of minutes from September 19th, 2017. Is a motion on the minutes? Approval. <coughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Mentions? Okay. Um, yes. So, who, who, who made the motion and who seconded it? So, Gary, thank you. And then uh, the only abstention was Mr. Alvin Thank you. Okay. And next up are reports from departments or subcommittees. DPW? Okay. So, from the DPW, um, we have a variety of uh, major construction projects going on right now that I'll, I'll run through and update. Um, major utility and roadway reconstruction on Day Avenue. Um, we have uh, water line replacement, storm water line replacement, um, some sewer work, and also um, uh, roadway will be repaved once that work is complete. So the plan is we're going to have a base layer of pavement uh, down for the winter, and then we'll have final pavement in the spring. Audubon Road, um, Audubon Road right now is closed to, to, through traffic during work hours. Um, that, that's also a major utility reconstruction project um, that is proceeding as planned. We're going to have the base layer of paving this fall, and again, the, the final layer in the spring. Um, Hinkley Street um, is, uh, also undergoing major reconstruction, uh, stormwater, sewer, water, and roadway, um, including sidewalks and a raised crosswalk at Nonatuck Street. Um, and the contractor is not there this week, but will resume work next week. Um, and that work, by the way, is expected to continue into next construction season. Um, Holyoke Street right now is closed to th to through traffic for drainage work across the roadway. Um, we anticipate that that work is going to be completed in late November. Um, North King Street, so this is not the DPW's project, um, it's a Mass DOT project and they've contracted with Palmer Paving to repave a um, section in North King from the interstate um, down just about uh, to the, or around the co-op area. Um, the, the work is anticipated to be complete by the end of October. There's a lot of raised structures there that I think are doing a number on people's cars. Um, also another um, couple of things that might be of interest to folks, um, VHB. So we contract with VHB for our pavement management services and each year they evaluate 25% of the city's streets and they update our pavement database and that uh, helps us to make decisions about what roadways are going to be reconstructed. So we, um, we will be doing our annual contract with them and that's what I'm looking for. Um, we also have um, plans to upgrade the equipment and a traffic signal cabinet on Jackson Street um, and for that we secured capital funding in last year's capital plan. Um, as, as part of this project, um, we would like to look at the feasibility of installing school and flashing lights for the Bridge Street Elementary School. Do you want to any, sorry, DJ? I am. Okay. Are there any questions? Um, any other departmental reports or anything from the subcommittees? 
So then going forward, we're going to get into the what's on our agenda for um, deliberation today. I, if, if it's OK with everybody, I'm going to take some things out of order because we have a bunch of people here to speak on certain things. Um, let me just first ask, is there anyone here to speak about Hatfield Street? No. OK. Um, so then. If you all don't mind, I'm going to start um, with item, move down all the way to item G, which is traffic calming on Cardinal Way. Um, and then we're going to move up to <coughs> item B, which is King Street. So um, I know that uh, Council of the Bard is here to talk about Cardinal Way, and there are multiple people who want to talk about it. Um, is there anything that we want to talk about first, or should we start with public comment on it? Thank you, Councillor Dan. Thank you to the Commission. Um, I'm City Councillor Marianne LaBarge, and um, I want to talk about Cardinal Way and the traffic study that was done. Um, the traffic study was done almost about two years ago, around the month of August, which a lot of the residents I talked about was not too happy that it was done, done at that time. Um, the children are out of school. The parents were not um, coming out from the side streets going into Cardinal Way, so the traffic kind of like relaxed at some point because of that. Um, and the reasons why they use Cardinal Way is because of the deplorable conditions of Hertzberg Road, in which it is. Um, we, had not, we heard nothing of this traffic study until just recently, I was informed by Councilor Ryan O'Donnell that there was a backlog and they were trying to catch up. And I know with our new director of the Department of Public Works has worked tirelessly, I mean tirelessly. She's very busy all over the place and I have to thank her for all the site visits that she has done with me. But anyways, because of that traffic study being held up for almost two years, I've had some residents, one of them who did come here to speak two years ago, of their young child who had died, not on Cardinal Way, but I think you can recall that, where they lost their son who had got hit by a car. Anyways, they have moved. I talked with them previously in regards that they couldn't believe that there was no study, and that they've sold their house, they're gone. But anyways, I just feel that it's sad when we come here with a petition, and I'm talking for myself and my, and my residents who work tirelessly with a petition to do and get it approved to do a traffic study, at least they are <coughs> communicated to. And also there's some transparency, that's very, very valuable because nobody told us that day when we came that there was going to be such a long backlog of holding it back. I'm here to work with you as a counselor with trying to work out a good compromise with the commission of what we can do to make all the residents, and I think now, I think we have 40-something children on Cognitive Way. We did have 44, so I'm giving a different number now. We have many young and middle age who walk their dog and walk, period, from the side streets onto Cardinal Way. People really enjoy walking through there. There's beautiful conservation land out there, and we have a lot of habitat. We have the turtles, which I did have a young child who was into turtles, and we had the Department of Public Works make little culverts to try to protect them, but that has not really done the job. Anyways, <clears throat> there are no lines on that street at all. I'm on there every day, every day. Seven days a week I go through that street. And you can see, when, because it's a thoroughway from both ways, you can get onto West Hampton Road, come in from West Hampton Road into Cardinal Way. On Pertzfort Road, you can come right into Cardinal Way. There are no lines, and I've seen people driving in there and it's like they're way over from the middle line of a road that should have a line on it. So I would really like you to look at that very carefully. I think we need to have 
lines placed on that road. The speed limit, that has been great concerns for, for a long, long time. Every time I talk about it, I hear, well, you know, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. This is very residential. It's probably one of the, the second largest streets of children on my ward. And I'm very concerned about this. If we drop it down, I think it's 35, and drop it down to 25, yeah, they're going to go 30. Right now, 35, they are going much faster than that. There's two bad curves on Cardinal Way, and I have great concerns about the visibility of cars coming in and the speed that's occurring on the street. I don't know what we can do. I need the help as a counselor. How do we alert people of these curves to slow down? We hear about making up signs, children's signs, drive slow. We've done that. We've done it on my ward. We've done it, we've had painting classes going on. One of the farmers let us use their barn. We had um, Channel 40 there. We placed them out all over the ward. They were gone, they stole them. People don't want to be told to see a sign slow down, children. They just don't want to see that and it's, it's terrible. I think also to the speed trailer that was there. I know I had to make a call myself. It was unoperative. And hearing from residents, they also had to make, make calls, so I don't know. What can be suggested about the curves and make people slow down is great concerns of mine. The speed limit, signage, something to educate the public. I do know we're talking about, on a recommendation of removing the children's signs, that you find that they are not going to solve a problem. I can't answer that. I'm not an engineer, but I'm asking for help. I'm hoping this evening we can have a good, reasonable talk and put all of our heads together to make a good compromise and all will be safe. He's in that area. Thank you. Um, my name is Erica Frank. I, I live at 217 Cardinal Way, and um, with Marianne, I was the person on my street that got the petition going and signatures for us to get this study going. Um, I completely agree with Marianne with everything that she said. Um, one of the other pieces about this study that I just wanted to mention is so. I live on a straightaway on Cardinal Way, and then there's the other straightaway with that really bad curve. There were no, um, none, of, none of the the pieces that they put down to check the speed were, those were not placed in those straightaways, and I think that that really would have given us a lot of information because that's where people are really speeding. And the, although I am concerned with the curves, they do naturally slow people down a little bit, but I do agree with Marianne that going 35 is, and even 28, which was reported there around the curve, is super, super fast for a very narrow street and curves that really have major blind spots on them. Um, what I wanted to do is, um, that I wanted to say too that um, there were several parents that wanted to come, and this is such a hard time at 4 o'clock. Everybody works pretty much to 5. So um, I do have a statement that I would like to read uh, to you from a parent, and I think it, um, it's, it's um, really shows what's happening in that spot. And this family just moved to the street in September and already have these concerns. We've, I've lived there 12 plus years. We've had these concerns all along, but it was just very telling to me that she's only been here a month. And this is, this is what she has said, so I'm gonna read this to you. I'm new to the neighborhood here at 133 Cardinal Way. After day one of living on the street, I realized that speeding is a major issue here. I didn't realize it was cut, a cut through street. My son had a friend over and he was nearly hit by a car and a little boy that lives across from me almost got hit when he was crossing the street coming over to my driveway on his bike. I've also been standing in the road collecting my mail when cars fly by without even slowing down. 
I purchased two orange construction cones and placed them in the road. So far, that has, this has been the only thing that has made a difference. 90% of the drivers hit the brakes while approaching them. I only put the cones out while the kids are playing. Lawn signs don't work. I have one of those too. A police officer driving by saw them on the road and carried them back to my front door and told me nicely that I'm not able to put the cones in a public freeway. Are you kidding me? This is the only thing that has helped reduce speed. Even 25 miles an hour is, is fast, especially around the corners. My brother lives in Long Meadow, and he too puts cones out in front of his house while his, while his young kids play. The neighbor complained. Police came, told him that it's wor if it's working to slow the speeding down, then he can continue to do so while his children are playing, and just to make sure that they take them off the road when the kids aren't outside. I found that interesting. While I can take only one young, while well, will it take only uh, our young children getting hit by a car for the city to make a change? I, re I read at some point that there are concerns about the lawn care trucks potentially being damaged by speed bumps. I don't really care about damaging someone's truck. If they drive slow enough over, I'm sure the trucks would be just fine. I care about protecting our children on this road. Kids should be able to play outside and ride their bikes without parents consistently fearing their worst. Not only is 35 miles an hour too fast, people are, are driving much faster than that. Peak times for speeding vehicles seem to be between 7 and 8.30 and 3 and 5.30 p.m. I'm not a transportation specialist, but I'm pretty sure that the only things that will prevent speeding are speed bumps. But I do feel that signs should be posted slowing the reduced speed limit of 20 miles to 20 miles an hour in addition to speed bumps strategically placed along the straightaways on Cardinal Way to, li to eliminate this issue. So I think that pretty much says it all. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Miranda. I also live on Cardinal Way. I live uh, at the corner of Cardinal Way and Birdstick Road. Uh, virtually every day I walk from uh, Bird Spirit Road down to Route 66 early in the day, and it depends on uh, the season, but anytime between 6 to 7, 7.30 in the morning. And the cars that come down the road are, I could almost tell which car it is because of the sound of the vehicles. The vehicles that are coming through there are pretty much people that use the road on a regular basis. They use it to cut through because of the terrible condition of uh, Bird Spit Road. I, I, myself, I live on Bird, the corner of Bird Spit Road, and I'll go down to Route 66 every day to come into town. I won't use Bird Spit unless absolutely necessary. But the point is, I see the same cars, same trucks, same vehicles day after day. Most of them are going much faster than is reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, they. There are a few cars that I could tell, I mean, they're, they're going well over 40, 45 miles an hour. I know there was a study, I know what the study, I read through it and tried to understand it with regard to the average speed of the vehicles. But there are a few things that I'd like to point out with regard to that. One is that uh, you have the sign uh, that shows what your speed is when you're approaching the speed uh, uh, area with the traffic area. You have the sign telling you what your speed is and what the speed limit is. I don't know about you, but think about what happens whenever you approach those signs. You see them all the time. Your natural instinct is to slow down. And so the cars that are coming across <coughs> already have seen a sign saying how fast they are. It's very likely they've slowed down a little bit uh, as they're going through the street. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, that I want to bring your attention to with regard to the study. There are 33 homes on Cardinal Way, uh, 30 of them from the top of the hill where the sign was out to Burt's Pit Road. And you have to consider that there are at least, most of the time there are at least two drivers per home, two cars. So many of the cars in this study are residents on Cardinal Way. And so I think that that brings down that average speed that is the, that is the conclusion of the study because we live there, we naturally go slow. I feel, uh, as Erica does, and as the lady that uh, 
that sent the letter that uh, it's very dangerous over there. I mean, I, I feel very strongly you should have speed bumps in there. Uh, I know that those are issues with speed bumps. You have situations with <clears throat> the cost of installing them, the, the snow plowing, etc. But you really, we don't want to have another situation like we had with uh, Mr. Porter over on Nanatuck Street where you delayed, delayed, delayed doing it. Finally, somebody gets seriously hurt or killed and now you decide to put them in. Uh, we don't want to see any of these kids uh, hurt on a Cardinal Way. And it, I, I walk it regularly and, and I'm concerned, very concerned. I don't have, obviously don't have any children in that age group, but it's a very uh, disconcerting situation. And I advocate strongly that you consider speed bumps for that road. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lonnie Kaufman. I live at 217 Cardinal Way. I'm also the uh, Ward 6 School Committee Representative for Northampton Public Schools. Um, I think my colleagues and wife um, said everything pretty much that you need to hear. I'll just add that, you know, it does seem like, as Councilor Labar said, we have over 40 little kids on our block. You see them all the time. They're, fun. They're having fun. They live on both sides of the road. Parents are doing all they can to keep them, you know, safe. But balls go on the road, dogs go on the road. It's just it, it's just a very a very happening block, and I think the study showed that we had in August we had over 700 cars going every day. I don't know what that compares to, but for a single block that seems like a lot, doesn't it? And we're just back and forth, back and forth. So I, I love the line idea um, that's in the study as a as a, one of the suggestions. So what I did is just drive with on one side of the road. I naturally find myself slowing down. I think that's a brilliant idea, particularly around the curve. So at the very least, we would love the support to have a line put in. That would be, that would really be helpful. Um, but I do think we, we can and we should do more. If the speed test was accurate, and I think that people have expressed some doubts, but even if it's accurate, I think the simple fact is that it's too high. Um, and I would, I would concur with, with what everybody else said, is that we just, um, need to put in like 25 miles an hour. I've seen that now that I'm paying more attention to it. I've seen that on Birch Pit, down by the community gardens. That's a big curve, no bigger than the one on Cardinal Way. I think if it makes a difference for whatever it costs, uh, it's worth a shot. And I certainly, if we can go um, all the way here and get speed bumps, I would certainly appreciate that as well. So thank you for the time uh, we have to express our concerns and for listening. And, and um, I'm hopeful we can come to a good conclusion and, and keep our kids safe. Thank you. Anybody else talk about Cardinal Way? Um, can, does anyone want to address some of the things that were brought up today? Or, you know, it's, should we go over the traffic calming application again? It, yeah, I can, I can provide some explanation of our thought process um, during this process. Um, so just a, a little bit of history for folks um, to kind of reiterate here. In October 2015, the application was initially submitted to the TPC and accepted by the commission for study. Um, in August of 2016, the traffic counters were installed. And what we found was the average daily traffic was 701 to 722 vehicles per day. The 85th percentile speed south of the curves was 36 miles an hour. Now, this is a roadway without a posted speed limit. It's a prima facie speed limit, and that's based on environmental factors, uh, meaning uh, what's the population density, how close are the, the houses together. Um, so this is an unposted speed limit. So the prima facie speed limit's 40. Folks are going 36 miles an hour in the 85th percentile. Um, the 85th percentile speed at the curve, so this is house number 161, is 28 miles an hour. The Fachi speed limit there is 30 miles an hour. Truck volumes range from 0.1% to 0.3%. So we, we look at the layout of the roadway, we look at the geography of, of the neighborhood, and what we recommended was the double yellow center lines to delineate travel lines be painted. Um, we think it's important also to install winding road signs um, on, on either end of the curves. And 
we're also recommending future removal of the existing children's signs. Um, I've had conversations with several people about this. Um, it, the use of children's signs and children at play signs is discouraged by agencies like USDOT and the Federal Highway Administration. Um, it is, uh, it's something that we sometimes call visual clutter. The, the signs become sort of ambient um, and they, they tend to provide a false sense of security to uh, parents and children that may increase risk. Um, they, they also give an impression that if the signs don't exist, there's no children. Um, so, so they're not necessarily um, providing uh, uh, the benefit that folks think they're providing. Um, we're recommending future removal of the existing children's signs. They can certainly remain in place until they're faded or damaged, but at that time they will be removed and not replaced. So the, our final observation is that the difference in the 85th percentile speeds that you're seeing on the straightaway versus on the curves is, is it, it's showing that the curves are naturally common traffic. So our recommendation is we strike the road, we put up warning signs for the curves, and it is our opinion that that will have a positive impact. Um, any other comments? <coughs> Thank you. Um, Just wondering what the DPW thinks about um, speed bumps. Um, we have uh, installed speed humps in several locations um, around the city, um, some uh, more recent than others. Um, they, uh, we, we recommend speed humps in certain situations where we feel that they are appropriate. And in this case, we did not feel that a speed hump is appropriate um, based on speeds and based on volume. We heard some concerns about the timing of when the study was done. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? So we have, um, it, I think as Councilor Labarge mentioned, um, the significant backlog of traffic calming uh, applications that, that have been sort of stacking up um, for quite some time. We have a limited window of time where we can do these traffic studies. Um, there they're not able to be done when the weather becomes inclement. Um, traffic counters can only stay down for a set amount of time before they start to get degraded by both weather and vehicles. Um, you know, it's it's the timing is what the timing is, but we have a, a, a window that we have to work within that we're trying to get all around the city. Um, you know, if it was obvious, the weather was good, we have to put the traffic counters down. Okay. Is there something else that's dependent on whether it's striping. Is, is there a plan for getting that striping done? We have a uh, line painting contract that we typically put out on an annual basis. So this does fog lines, center lines, it's citywide. Um, we anticipate putting out a, a contract that will capture um, recommendations from certain traffic calming applications as well as areas that, that we need to strike. Um, so it'll be kind of one large comprehensive contract um, that will be coming in, in the current months. And that would be for, for I assume, after the, the winter, after the winter Correct. for the spring Correct. painting season. Correct. Um, and one other question for me is, what are the possibilities for changing the speed limit on this stretch? Um, because it's a prima facie speed limit, we could certainly look at what the uh, density of houses is, I don't know that you're going to need the metrics to reduce speeds, to reduce the prima facie speed. Um, is this one of these situations where there's a risk of it getting raised if we look at it or no? No, there is no official engineering study for speed limit associated with this work with. So there is no posted mass DOT approved speed limit for this road. It's considered to be a prima facie speed limit. And so with that being said, you know, we can certainly look at the population density, meaning how close together are the houses, and is this something that we can uh, reasonably move to adjust the prima facie speed limit. Okay. Um, with Okay, first of all, are there any other questions? And then would, would the commission like the DPW to go ahead and do that? Any questions? 
So if you reassess it and deem it could be lowered, is that something that you then post, or is it then just known by law enforcement that it has to be lower? It becomes known. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a, 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 posted, a posted speed limit, and, and this is, this kind of opens up a, a conversation regarding many other streets throughout the city, you know, is this considered a thickly settled roadway, and then you kind of go street by street, and it's considered thickly settled, and the signs are posted kind of uh, at, the, at the limits of where your thickly settled district is. But it's kind of a larger conversation about these more densely populated areas of the city. Um, just a general question, since I'm not familiar with Cardinal Way, or for some of the residents, um, is is there trees and forest and vegetation up close to the road, or is it behind the houses? And is there any parking on the street for those 33 houses? Or is pretty much everybody parks in their driveways? Uh, yeah, every, everybody parks, everybody has uh, yeah, garages. So, I mean, we have trucks on the road that are there often landscaping. Um, but, and we have trees all along um, the road, and then there's also, you know, on, along, all along both sides of the road, which also has now that, now that the street's like 13 years, 14 years old, they've really grown in a lot, and that also causes some um, issues with visibility, but not as much as the curb itself. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Have residents ever tried parking on the street to slow traffic? Like I, honestly, I, our, street is, our street is so narrow that I fear for my car <laughs> to be hit. It's really, um, I had a party recently. I made sure everybody parked on one side of the road because you can't even get through if two cars are right across from each other. So I, no, we, have, we haven't done that as um, a way to calm, but, but it, uh, yeah, we haven't done it. Any other questions, thoughts? There was also a question about um, Burt's Pit paving down the schedule for anything you can do. Um, we have survey out on Burt's Pit right now, um, which will be used for future design for burglary construction. Okay. No dates are. It's not I like have, I have no yet. dates. Um, yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, um, what what is this? Where does the speed limit default to if there isn't? Um, can you go over that again? What, if there's no speed limit sign on the road, did you say it's 40 for our road? Yeah, it defaults to what's called the Prima Facci speed right. limit. And so on, on the straightaway, the Prima Facci speed limit is 40 miles an hour. Okay. Where the curves are, um, the Prima Facci would be 30 miles an hour. Okay. Because that just, that's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. That to me is If you is haven't crazy. driven the road, you should drive it and try to drive it at 30 miles an hour and you just see that it's not, it's not appropriate. And, and I would suggest that you do that before you take your vote on what you're going to do because <coughs> if you're not familiar with that road, uh, it's dangerous at, that, at 30 miles an hour. Um, so as it's Stands, it sounds like it's set to be striped, and I don't know if there's any further action that we would be voting on. If pending yeah. pending approval okay. through the TTC. Okay. okay, so we could put on, we could continue this item, and everyone could go take a tour of Cardinal Way if they like, and we could continue that conversation next week, <coughs> um, or we could vote on the recommendations that are in that. Regarding the speeding, you said essentially you thought if we looked at it further, it wouldn't qualify for lower speed. Yeah, the pre prima facie speed limits are based, they're, they're not our discretion. They're right. based on geographic criteria, meaning how close are these houses yep. together. And there's a, a certain metric for setting a prima facie speed limit. Yep. So it's, it's certainly measurements that we could analyze, but it's not up to the DPW to set a prima facie speed limit. 
So should we can, should we have the DPW analyze them and um, and continue this till next month and hear what that analysis? But you don't think it's going to make a difference because the houses are far apart, right? That's what you're. Yeah, we. I've driven on. I mean, the houses are far apart, but it's also it should, the speed limit should be lower. But that's just <laughs> uh, the roads narrow. But I get it, if it's not going to qualify, it's probably not worth the time to ask the DPW to invest when you already know that it's not going to qualify. It's it's geographic criteria. Right. Yeah. right. You know, it's, yep. it's not for us to and say. There were questions about what the signage would be at that point anyway. It didn't sound like we were just going to stick new speed limit signs up there. It would have to be part of a larger conversation in the city about Not necessarily a, a larger conversation, but it, we would have to determine, you know, is this a thickly settled area? Yeah. I don't believe, it, and Maggie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe this meets the criteria. Of the so, it's thickly settled where <coughs> there are the houses, further down where the straightaway is, where the houses are further apart, that doesn't qualify as thickly settled, which is why it's 40 miles per hour. So, does the city not have the legal authority to lower the speed limit? So, it, the way speed limits are raised and lowered is through engineering studies. So when there's a posted speed limit, that is posted because at some time there was an official engineering study that was done and submitted to MassDOT for approval that MassDOT signed off on and the speed limit was posted. On roads where there is no posted speed limit, it's a prima facie speed limit that is based on geographic criteria. So Mass DOT has to approve the speed limit on every s street in the Commonwealth? Mass DOT approves the engineering study and recommendation associated with a, uh, any particular roadway that you actually set the sign on. And then all of us as drivers of vehicles just are supposed to know that the prima facie speed limit on the straightaway is 40 miles an hour and then we go down to 30 miles an hour on the curve. <laughs> I'm just playing out the absurdity. No, you're reminded of that if you're cool. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I I would like to see at least the striping get into the, the schedule. So if someone wanted to, to make a motion to at least have this done, it doesn't preclude us from looking at this issue. So I'm sorry. I'm ready to make a motion. Oh. Uh, I, I move that we uh, proceed with recommendations proposed in the study, which is yellow striping and the uh, winding road signs. I'll second. Yeah. Any further discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will abstain. One abstention. <coughs> and any notes? Okay. Um, okay, so that passes. So that will, that will at least get done and if, you know, we're always open to talk about it some more, but it would be great to see if that can really help your situation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I am going to bring us back up to item B, which is crosswalk safety on King Street at Summer and North. Um, uh, Mark, how do you pronounce your last name? Chucky. Yes. Mr. Chucky. Mary and his daughter very patiently waiting. Um, so, Mr. Chucky contacted me about this. This is a situation I'm very familiar with. It's something we've all talked about and seen before. We're talking about um, the crosswalk that's in front of Dunkin' Donuts, where Summer doesn't really meet North at that really difficult intersection. And there's no um, crosswalk signal or anything like that. And it's it's just a very difficult place to cross. You never have a dedicated time to cross because um, the only time you can cross is when the light is red on King and then people are turning from summer on King. Um, so Mark, I told Mark we, would, we could talk about this. Um, it's, it's too bad that Mr. Fine is not here because uh, Councilor O'Donnell was in contact with Mr. Biden and um, also David Blatter from DPW and found out some information 
about this intersection, which is apparently in the queue for a transportation improvement program um, funding, and which is federal funding. And we've con the DPW, um, maybe can speak to this, the DPW has contracted with Fuss and O'Neill to, um, to move, I think, to full design and to do a public um, forum about this at some point, although the, the date's not set. But nevertheless, we're looking at maybe around 2020 when this could be happening. Um, so it's great that that plan is in the works. Um, <coughs> but I, I, I would love it if Mr. Rajek, you wanted to if you wanted to talk about this at all, and then if we could see if there's any other way that we could make crossing there safer, at least for the next two and a half years or before this gets done, because it's it's something that's certainly been brought before us. And I appreciate it, Councillor, and I appreciate that it's already in motion to some extent. My daughter Nan and I, were, we cross over there every day to go to her school in the morning. And it, we've twice in the last month have been in the middle of that crosswalk. Um, and two cars have separately almost hit us. And uh, there was a lot of screaming and yelling of, on my part just to get the cars to stop. And it was pretty scary for both of us. And to their credit, both cars did stop. And um, one of the first driver actually turned around from where he was going, pulled over to the side of the road, and he apologized. And he told me his perspective, which is as the driver coming um, west from North Street there, as you're coming under the bridge underpass, and you're trying to take a left onto King Street going southbound, he said, you know, it's, it's difficult for us because we don't always see the, um, the crossers in the crosswalk because of where our you know, our windshield anchors are. Um, and this was a professional driver, and I, I took him at his word. Um, I thought he was still kind of going too fast, but the second driver that almost hit us was um, a mother who had two kids in the back seat, and she didn't appear to be distracted or anything. But all traffic signs were telling her that she had the freedom to turn left and did not see us um, who were midway through the crosswalk. So I understand it from the driver's perspective that they are being told to go to take a left or um, you know, in the case of taking a right to go north on, on King Street, they do that as well. But there's no way for us as pedestrians to be able to cross safely there. And so um, what I contacted the counselor about was it, to see if there's any kind of interim solution, if there's a kind of a temporary sign that could be put up, or I, I'm not an engineer and I don't know how these things work, but um, I just wondered if, if any ideas could be uh, put forward by others who are a lot more knowledgeable. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the, where I'm talking about, where we're talking about. Um, but another thing, I mean, it's a very confusing intersection because, as I said, summer and north don't line up. So there's always, as people are going, summer's a one-way street, as they're crossing over to go to the north, there's like a moment of not knowing whether the person is going to, what, what the person coming on north is going to do and which one has right of way. And it's, every, I mean, everyone's always confused there. So you're focused on that. and and additionally not looking at the crosswalk because of that that reason. So I open it up to the commission to any ideas or thoughts on that. Are there any that activated crossing lights there? No. No, there's not even, yeah, there's no crossing signal. Right. There's just a crosswalk. There's crosswalks, but no signal ones for pedestrians. So. Right. We have had some luck with the pedestrian paddles. Okay. I know that was helpful. I don't know. Sam is still here. Street. Those were on South Street and they had some impact to slow people mm -hmm. down, even if not just to alert them that there's a crosswalk there. I mean, that's an easy right. thing to add. Do you think it would be helpful to put one on King and then also one on North where the light is? Because there's also a crosswalk there. In the interest, sorry, it's, it can't go under the light, right? There's a, oh, that right? There's a rule you told us about one time how you can't put <coughs> it under the light. Right. Since there's so much traffic going out, I'm turning the vehicle on that, they always get turned away. Right. But I think there are other, like, we put up two yield to, yield to pedestrian while turning signs, if you recall, when you're going on Main Street, turning on to New South, going East South. Mm -hmm. We put up two new ones that are in pressure reflective, oh. with this yield to pedestrians. You can think about some of those that are turning people's mm -hmm. coming off of Summer Street. Mm -hmm. 
where they hang from the light or are they on a post? They're the post or on the traffic signal And if we did the paddles, uh, those are the orange ones that are actually in the crosswalk? Right, those are the yellow ones. But the I don't ones, think right. we want to put those in a large intersection like that. Right.
let's start with A because I can introduce that and Ms. Hopper's also here for that. So um, A is consideration from the commission for sponsorship of a resolution in support of bills at 2100 and H 1900 concerning the safety of school bus children embarking and disembarking school buses. Uh, it's a resolution I am bringing to the commission. Um, because, so this week is School Bus Safety Week. Um, Sam was here back in March, I believe, to talk about the problem um, that she sees <coughs> on South Street and that we know is happening throughout the city where uh, people violate the stop arms of school buses, meaning they go around school bus stop school buses. Um, and that has led us to do a big push this week <coughs> for school bus safe, National School Bus Safety Week. So um, the mayor has a proclamation that he read at the school committee meeting last Thursday, and he's also going to read at the council meeting this Thursday um, in support of the week. And um, a lot, Sam and I, along with Chief Casper and, and PD um, and Northampton Community Television, uh, we produced a really amazing PSA that everyone should watch. I can send the link to the commission um, that. Um, has a bunch has kids from each of the elementary schools um, in a really cute short video talking about school bus safety and about stopping for school buses. Thank you. I shared it. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. You guys did an amazing job. We're we're pretty proud of it. Um, so that is also going to be played at the council meeting on Thursday, and I can say has over about it has like 1,100 shares so far or views. One or two per one. Wow. So we're really proud of that. Um, and in addition, um, I am bringing forward this resolution. So when Sam was here in March, we uh, Chief Casper brought up this legislation, which is um, to allow uh, violation detection systems on the stop arms of school buses and would only capture a violation of that um, of the stop arm. And so I wrote this resolution, which I'm happy to read if you'd like me to. And I'm bringing it to the council one just because it's been in the commission because we've discussed it, but also to ask if the commission would like to additionally co-sponsor it. So um, Councilor Nash is, is another co-sponsor on it. And if the commission would like, um, I would be delighted to have the commission additionally co-sponsor it. Um, it won't. It didn't make it for the for the council agenda. So that's an amendment that I would make on the floor. If the commission. So what's everyone's pleasure? Would you like me to read it? Has everyone read it? Yes. You want to read the entire thing? Not if you don't want me to. <laughs> I've read it. You've read it, okay. Yeah. If everyone's comfortable and doesn't want me to read it, that's fine. Um, does anyone have any questions about it? Councillor Nash, we are talking about the resolution. Oh, okay. I was talking walking school bus with him. I, I'm not calling you out for leaving the room. I'm just <laughs> telling you what we're doing. Um, so, uh, so if everyone's read it, does anyone have any questions or would anyone like to discuss it? Yes. I, I, uh, so we're talking about requiring a, a vendor. So we, we don't own buses. We hire custom companies. So this would require them to provide a some kind of recording device, camera, or whatever that would go. They fit it on their stop signs on the side of the bus. That, Right. So, right. right, it's that stop sign that swings out. Okay, is this violation, will this be captured in both directions? So it looked both ways? I would imagine it probably thinks. I would think so. Yes, I think so. Do we think this is going to cost a lot of money? I mean, it seems like it would not necessarily be a lot of money. It might cost $1,000 per bus maybe or something like that. but. That's many steps down the line. So this resolution, yeah. So this is this is legislation that is presently. I should have told you this. This is in the both. So there are two bills. There's the House bill and the Senate bill. They're identical. They are both in the respective Ways and Means committees. Um, and if passed by the legislature, then um, it would just enable municipalities to be able to use these. So then the next step would the City Council would need to vote on it. The school committee would need to vote on it as well, and then you would you would well you would contract with the company to provide these cameras, and the school committee would have to vote on that contract. 
So it is, okay, right. It's many steps down. It's many steps down. Line. As, but for right now, it wouldn't be legal to use them, so this would be to change the law um, so that that would be legal. So what you're asking us to do then is to vote to support this. Is that right? To vote to, if you'd like to, to co-sponsor the resolution in support of this legislation. So really would mean that City Council would vote to do this, and we're recommending that they do that. Or, or, I'm not sure exactly where we are on that. Unless if I understand your question. So, the City Council would be putting their support behind the legislation and sort of asking for a push for it. And City Council maybe is looking for advice from us on that. Or, or I think it's relevant to this commission. Yes, yeah. I do too. So, uh, you have a motion? What? Uh, certainly. Um, I, I move that we vote in favor of supporting this resolution. Does that mean co sponsoring it? Or? Yes, yes, it would. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Um, further discussion on the motion or the resolution? So, just a, a question for clarification, Councillor. Uh, so we're voicing our support. Um, council votes to approve it. Does the results of that go to the state legislature? Yes. Okay. So, yes. So the, the last paragraph is a laundry list of places it will be sent to. Um, so the, the original sponsors in the House and the Senate and then um, our representatives um, yeah, and the, the chairs of the both of those House Councilor Nash, would you like to talk about Yeah, I w uh, so uh, first of all, um, you're, 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 um, we're looking for your support for this resolution as the co-sponsors, and then we'll bring it before council on Thursday, Thursday. And, that, um, and that having your backing along with our sponsorship, our hope is that it will pass council. Um, as far as the cost of these, I, I did a little research, G, G. Ellen, Councillor Shiar and I did some research. Um, they, they're anywhere in like the $400 to $800 range, depending on the type of uh, system you get. Um, some look fancy, some look like a video recorder on the side of the bus. And so, um, but that, um, so the, the cost, I, I don't think it's that prohibitive. Um, the other thing is that the, the area that they um, that they take images of is the area in which a vehicle isn't supposed to be. So that you know, and um, and I know Chief Casper knows that we're discussing cameras a lot, <laughs> but <laughs> but in this case, that the only people who would be in view would be people violating the law, and so. Um, that's the, the other piece that I, that I think is important um, as we tease out the, this question of cameras. So. Just to piggyback on that since the camera word was brought up. Um, additionally, the ordinance that the council is looking at, which is in the process of being amended, um, it only talks about uh, fixed stationary cameras. So even if that ordinance were to pass <coughs> as it is right at this moment, um, these still wouldn't fall under it because these are not um, fixed cameras. They're on a moving vehicle and they themselves because it's a stop arm. So, yes. And the last thing is that, that it, it depends on the system, I believe, but, the, but by and large they're described as they're only on when the stop arm is extended. So while it's driving down the street, it's not recording anything.
about trying to get them painted yellow, but that's still so sad. Um, yeah, I don't know if there could be something adapted to a man, but these are specific. Sam, could I speak to it really quickly? Absolutely. Like, I don't know if there's any hesitation, especially since the camera word was brought up, but I know, like, from my experience where my daughter's bus stop is, people stop more when they see the cops when they see cops pulling people over, but we don't have that kind of staffing. So this would be another tool for MPD to help us enforce these violations. Um, and then in terms of money and stuff, like I definitely know that's an issue. And in part of me trying to go forward with this is to ask about grant funding for this, because as you know, our schools don't have money. Um, but it was brought up, um, Ms. Walzak, the business administrator for North Carolina Public Schools, is currently working on the bus bid specs for the next contract and it was brought up that if this legislation goes through that whoever gets the contract like they they can't charge us more because of new legislation like this would be part of the law and they would have to go along with it they can't somehow up the bid or charge the school district more and then i have to look further into this but superintendent provost had talked about local options of being able to retrofit buses if this law is passed at no cost to the district. I don't know more about that, but um, I mean, this is something that's on their radar too. But again, we can't do any of this until it's passed and the law is amended at the state level. But from my own personal experience, people getting tickets is what's stopping people for the buses. Not, I mean, the, the paddles have slowed people down, which is great. I stand out there with a sign which was recommended at this commission earlier this year. People don't care about that. They care about getting a ticket. So this would help. Thanks. Any further questions or discussion? No? Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstentions? Thank you very much, everyone, for being the co-sponsor this with me. And, and Councilor Nash, appreciate it. And all the work Sam's done. Well, Sam, and that is, Sam's like a phenomenon in and of itself. She's remarkable. Um, okay, so let's move to C, which is issues related to parking near Bridge Street School, which Councillor Nash is also here to speak about, correct? Uh, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so basically, I, 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 I've talked about this with Councillor Chiara, with Councillor O'Donnell, with uh, parents at Bridge Street School, with the principal, um, and it, so I was elected last November, and one of the first things I heard about was the, the pickup drop-off at Bridge Street School and what a mess it was. And I have consistently heard about it over and over again um, over the last year. And that, um, that the, the issue is that, um, uh, that there is no clear pickup drop-off place for parents who need to have eye-to-eye -eye contact with teachers as they're picking up or dropping off their child. This may, now some children, you know, it's okay they're old enough that they have an arrangement with the teachers um, that, um, and they can just hop out of the car at the curb and dart in and that's fine. But there's, there's a portion of the student body who requires a eye-to-eye um, uh, -eye contact where the parent escorts the child up to the teacher, could be preschool, could be kindergarten, could be a, um, a, um, a special ed class. And um, so we're, we're trying to consider ways to have that kind of zone around Bridge Street School. One of the ideas that we were talking about was uh, creating uh, such a zone along Union Street um, that um, to take some of the spaces um, that, uh, that currently are, are used by residents on the street and turn them into 15 minute spaces for uh, most of the day um, and then return them to 
uh, uh, unlimited parking uh, at the end of the school day. So approximately a half hour before the school day begins uh, so that the spaces would clear out and then a half hour after the school day um, so that residents could move back in. The spaces could also be used throughout the day uh, by um, parents coming to you know, drop off a lunch, pick up a child who needs to go to a dentist appointment, um, you know, all of the stuff that parents do with children throughout the day. Currently within the parking lot of Bridge Street School, there are, um, there's really no parking for this. That there, there are assigned spots within that area, within the, the parking area, within the lot, but typically they're, they're taken up by staff with an agreement between the staff and the administration that it's kind of okay to park there because they are so pressed for parking for the, the, the school staff. Um, and, um, you know, um, uh, Principal Choquette, you know, relate with me, you know, that in the past that, you know, the, the first of the year where she's handing out parking space and she, and there's been times where she's had staff walking away in tears knowing they don't have a space but in, that they're parking wherever. They're parking off the property somewhere. So it's a big deal that they actually be able to park on the property. Um, so, and if anybody, if you've looked at the, the property um, from a, you know, a Google map, you can see that the frontage of the school is actually, it's this teeny portion right along um, uh, Parsons. And that, um, and that is where we, uh, the, the city has recently um, decided to start enforcing and understandably enforcing the no parking <laughs> that um, that goes on there but that's where all of the pickup drop-off happened and where these parents were had there, there was this quiet agreement that they they could do this and now that's gone so um, the um, so I guess what I'm asking for is ideas on how to address this. I mean, I, I've since had some back and forths around the, the, the 15 minute spaces on Union and um, I spoke with Marilyn Richards and Marilyn was kind of like, well, you know what? It's like you're, you're po poking a hornet's nest. And her point was, it's okay if you're gonna do that if it solves the problem. But she was like, but Jim, it sounds like it may help a little rather than solve the problem. And I think for the for these parents, we need to come up with a way to solve this. Um, so, what do you got for ideas? <laughs> so, as one of those parents. Um, oh yeah, you're one of those parents you see out there. Oh, it's Sam's daughter. Sam's daughter. I don't have to talk about. Yeah. Um, I mean, my concern, as we talked about, with the idea of the 15-minute zone on Union is that you have the same. There, there won't be no turnover, right? And so you've got a population that needs that space all at the same time. So whether it's 15 or all day parking, it doesn't really matter because after they drop off their kid, they're out. Um, so I'm not sure how much that will help that situation. The best idea that I've come up with that um, I shouldn't even take credit for is my husband's idea. I didn't know he, he, he came up with it, but um, was maybe exploring what we can do with um, making, um, what's the street? Parsons, Union. Pars I guess it's Parsons. Um, a one way at a certain amount of time. Now I don't know, like if, if there would be a way that during school, or all the time, but if um, during school drop off and drop off and pick up, pick up if you could block off one side mm -hmm. and just have it be a one way from you know Union down to Bridge Street that might help with the traffic situation and would you just have to make sure that people didn't try and park in that space that you know so people created. would be lining up against Lampard Park right. to let the kids out um, yes, but you wouldn't have the thing. 
What's that? Let's get Bill sharing. Yeah. You wouldn't have people trying to park on both sides, on the Lambert side and the cemetery side, and then tr have two lanes of traffic trying to come mm -hmm. through there. You'd only have one lane of traffic. But you'd need to find some, if it was going to be only during drop off and pick up, you'd need to have either like an arm that swings out to, I see that you're skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> that an arm that swings out to make it one way or like a sawhorse or something. And by the way, there, we have other initiatives going on. We're, we're, we're working on developing a walking school bus route. I was just mentioning it to the parent who was here talking about crossing at King Street. Um, the idea is to get less driving to school and dropping off and uh, more parents it's supervised walking is essentially what it is uh, parents uh, you know uh, volunteers walking with children stopping along the way picking up kids along the route uh, we designed one for the north street um, neighborhood and then one coming up uh, uh, williams and pomeroy and um, so we're working on that we, i was mentioning it is it mark was that yeah, that maybe we could have something from his neighborhood as well. <laughs> uh, but again, so we're, we're trying to come up with, because it's a systematic problem, and, uh, but we need to come up with some sort of solution for these parents who, there are parents who are just in that zone, they can't walk, they, it, they could be school choice kids, a lot of them are, you know, they're, they can't walk, their parents are dropping them off from East Hampton. They need the eye to eye contact. And um, so. And the, the loop in front is only for school buses? That's the best. It's only for school buses. And it's really teeny. You know, it's like. And no matter, I mean, we've tried, they've tried putting out cones and stuff. People just like move the cones, run over the cones to try and protect that space so the buses can get back out. But then also when the bus is trying to go down that road and you've got people parked on each side and then you've got a car coming up, it's impossible. Nancy, do you have any thoughts about this? <laughs> Come on, Nancy, solve this. Uh, yeah. uh, have you, I'm, I'm curious if you have brought the residents of Union in on any of these conversations. No, I have not yet. Because unless I have like, like Marilyn was cautioning, cautioning, you know, look, I, I'll go there. I, you know, I'm willing to go there. If I felt like this was going to solve the problem for parents, you know, I, I'd be willing to have a few angry constituents, you know, because it, it, it's a really big problem. But if, it, it, if it's only marginally going to, you know, it'll make some parents happy, we'll still have the problem. So maybe go there and see if they're, Maybe they'll give up the whole street. Maybe they would. They, they'd be like that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very congested, I mean, we all know, it's a very congested street as far as parking and parking complaints already. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just wondering if it wouldn't be a good idea to bring residents in on any kind of a conversation on making any changes right. to parking. And Councilor O'Donnell noted that we could try something temporarily too. We wouldn't have to go for a permanent fix. We, should, we could say we're going to give this a try and then solicit feedback. Okay. Any any anything else anyone can add or think up on this problem? I know we got like lots of tough problems today. Um, Look at all these heads. You guys can't think of something. All right. <laughs> So, Only things that would cost a lot of money. <laughs> what, a, a garage or something? No, a widening Parsons Street so that the school, ball, school bus drop-off zone and you have room for more buses, more cars, more whatever. But the best solution is well, walking your, your children to school, in my opinion, but I don't think you're going to get a very big turn on that either, especially if you're coming from East Hampton. Right. <laughs> so I think make you more room physically. And I do wonder about who was big lawn beyond that semicircular bus drop off. That's actually Parkland. Well, it's just me. It's that's a park. That's Lampern Park. Right. So it'd be Lampern Parking Park. It's a protected Lampern, park. Lampern <laughs> Auto Park. <laughs> You've got the park oh, Lord. just right there. <laughs> <laughs> so right. Major Act of Congress to change.
change that. Yeah, and so that's what I mean. I, because we've, looked, we've looked, looked at this over the years. I know. I've so, always come up. And we've got a cemetery, cemetery on the other side of the street. So. <laughs> How's it? Next meeting of the TPC. We meet at Lampton Park. I don't know if Park is a commuter line to show them to walk through towns. Um, you know, that's been one of the ideas for the walking school bus is to have it start at the at the commuter lot and then the kids could be picked up there and brought to school. And what else is your thoughts on Bridge Street? Bridge Street and they walk through Lampton Park and exactly. A lot of parents do park on Bridge Street. You can park on Bridge Street. Uh, those spots tend to, what happens with those spots is they tend to fill up with people who are parking more long-term. Part of the problem with Bridge Street School is the success of the community, is that there's a ton of parents who get there early, and, and, you know, in the morning for their kids to hang out and play together, they socialize. Uh, same thing happens after school. And so there's there's all of this great stuff going on. It's not like the place is deserted, you know, right after the bell. So and so what's happening is parents are, um, you know, they're parked all along there. That's where they see the long-term parking is. I mean, maybe that's idea. We we say that's no longer long-term parking, and then we push them somewhere. Well, that's I think that's exactly what I was thinking. And somebody said it as I was thinking it is to have the bus drop them on Bridge Street, go through the new park, mm -hmm. so that the kids, the buses can see the school, the kids can see the school as good line of sight, and turn the bus drop off place on Parsons into the car drop off. You're looking for a couple of parking spaces, right? We're looking for, we're looking for a quick way for parents to pull over, get the eye to eye, and then, and actually the loop would, would be better for that, because the, 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 the teacher could actually be at the top of the stairs right there. Part of the problem with the other places that they park, the, they don't have the line of sight, so they have to get out of the car. They might have another child going to daycare, and so they gotta get that kid out of the car. So what, what do you think it would take to, so by ordinance, if there's a legitimate parking space on Bridge Street, there could be bus zone parking, mm -hmm. which would take two to four parking spaces, something like that. That's how, I mean, that doesn't involve pavement, other than maybe some signs and paint. Right. Mm -hmm. That would mean the school department giving up their loop. No, well, it's, it's, it's the parents. It's the parents' loop. Right. The school department is there to serve the parents, aren't they? And the children. Um. What's well, an idea? Maybe bring to the principal and see what she thinks. All right. I'll bring that idea back. Uh, so there's two people in this commission. Bus drivers would like that better too, because it's much easier for them to, to get in and out of that loop. So, unless they're heading, you know, in the wrong direction or something. Oh, but the right people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, the idea is I brought up are moving the buses over to Bridge Street, opening the loop to parents, and some idea of creating one way on Parsons. Okay. So who do I go into to the city to help kind of create, mock up some ideas around it? I don't know, city councilor. Am I talking about <coughs> <in> here? <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, why don't you, why don't you float that idea at the school and see. All right, see if that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Couldn't it possibly be Joy Whitting as yeah. well? Just True. Like Joy Whitting is a transportation person. Yes, you're a few more weeks. <laughs> She's a transportation person. <laughs> Might be I mean, she's got a lot of knowledge about it, so she yeah, probably I, a good place I, to start. Thank you, Councilor. I was just saying, she's applying for another job very publicly. <laughs> um, okay, so we're getting there. We are down to D, um, which is the ordinance to amend section 31278 providing standards for the use of multi-use trails. Sure. Um, this is for the low speed electric bicycles. So Wayne is not here. So we have we should have the change the proposed uh, language to 
in the ordinance um, is is the DPW prepared to talk about this or is anyone I, I did work with Wayne a little bit oh, on this fantastic. so I'm waiting for it to come up here but um, in general I believe the issue where this kind of started is it was pointed out that there are uh, electric wheelchairs for one thing or they're not really wheelchairs but the like three wheel larger scooters scooters sure that operate on the path sometimes um, and technically those are actually in would be in violation um, there's also kind of the emergence of, of motorized skateboards and motorized and electric bicycles so there's kind of a lot of new modes of transportation uh, and they've begun to appear on the on our path so I actually got an email from a a resident who was kind of asking about it, like they're, that person was saying they were kind of noisy, depending on what the item was, and wanted some more enforcement action around that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, as everything does, opened up a can of worms just regarding all these other things that are using it. And then it, when I reached out to Wayne, it just so happened that um, he was working on his initiative on the uh, electric bicycles, uh, you know, having those. What's the name of that? Electric assist. Yeah, maybe. The the, yeah, yeah, like the. Having a group of bikes here that are going to be oh the bike share bike share thank you yes um, so with that coming in too there'd be an expectation that these bicycles would be on a, on our rail tracks and also would be in violation so he worked on changing this uh, in order to meet some of those accommodations so that electric items uh, bicycles would be able to be on the paths legally uh, and it, it pretty clearly continues to prohibit uh, gas. Uh, bicycles really or any gas propelled <laughs> item but you may have heard the if someone has like a lawnmower motor on there like it's pretty loud if it goes by so those would continue to not be allowed on bike paths so specific to electric motors it's a little confusing to me in reading it because section one re defines mm -hmm. the low speed electric bikes as going less than 20 miles an hour which is pretty fast for a bike um, and then section two says it shall not exceed a speed of 12. i guess it can be capable of going 20 but the speed limit would be 12. I just, um, um. I think how wait, so Mr. Fine described that these they're like yeah. smart bikes and so once they were on the trail their speed would be limited like you would not be able to make it go faster than the speed limit am I I didn't like make that up right no I said that right okay <laughs> it's a bike trail they'll have it's like a geo tracking right it's got, it's got a GPS uh, system so it knows where you are so it's not a go around it exactly so even though it's capable of going 20 on the trail, it would not be able to go to more than 12. Right. That's that particular. But, but if you're on a bicycle, you can go over 12? Well, I know not I can. Uh, well, Is that true? That's easy for me. I mean, I can go down more than 12 miles an hour on bicycles all the time. All the time. Well, this yeah. is defined as on a level surface. It seems somewhat arbitrary at 12 miles an hour. It, I'm not advocating for some high rate of speed, but. Miles an hour. Just to be clear, it's 20 is pretty fast. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. especially on our own track. On a level ground, it's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty fast. Most people aren't going to yeah. do it. In fact, 12 is more like an average. Other than average, if you're just riding around the town, going downhill, you might hit 25 or something, but your average would be 12. I did. My question is are we entertaining, not in this ordinance, but are we, are we looking at speed limits on rail trails at some point? <coughs> and that's kind of what imagine. this sounds like in New York. Yeah. This, this equipment to regulate your speed. We could let you go 20, but on our rail trails, it'll only go 12. And so, as you as you said, what what about me on my pedal bicycle going downhill? It's only two percent, but it makes it a lot easier to go 20. I I mean I thought I remembered Wayne saying that there were already like some sort of speed limit is on there. Am I? It's, it's a, it's a, uh, a I don't know. Defect, what's the term? 
Signage and uh, enforcement. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Highly unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I, like, how do you? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, uh, I mean, this one piece of equipment that sort of is pretty well described in section one will do automatically restrict your speed to 12. Right. But I did see a guy go to a parking lot about two weeks ago on a what do I see for you? The whole thing in his hand. That guy was, he was going at least 12, maybe faster. It was kind of surprising. Yeah. Hmm. Is it um, any state or federal legislation? I don't know. I, I don't know that answer. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think that we are, a, does anyone know, the bike share is not imminent because I think we're at least a few months out from it. Is that is that what everyone else recalls to? So we could, I think, hold this till the next meeting and hopefully Wayne will be there and he can maybe answer some of those questions. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Mm -hmm. Seems good. Okay, no, so, that's... okay. Let's continue, Let's continue um, this. And then I think that brings us to our last item that we haven't covered which was Henshaw Avenue. So this was continued from the meeting, from our last meeting, um, and we'd asked DPW to look at um, a proposal to move parking to the, uh, to the other side of the street, which they have, and they have <coughs> produced a new map um, and a changed ordinance. So 17.38. Ordinance relative to Park and Henshaw. Um, would you would you like to go through? There? Sure. So if you're looking at this map, then the two different sides on it. On the left, that's existing currently. What's out there, or what's stated in the ordinance, and on the right is proposed. So we look at moving parking on the southern side of. Henshaw Avenue to the western side, and it's it's feasible, and we might lose a few spaces because there are a couple of fire hydrants on that side. But I think we could put signage up so that people would park in that area. Um, I don't know if there's going to be any pushback from Smith because of the change in direction or anything like that. I mean, I think parking is variable depending on how someone parks, the size of the vehicle. So it's probably around the same amount of 20 vehicles or so. Well, what's the thinking behind this? Why are we changing it? There that? were residents on the northerly side, um, close to where the curve is, and those residents had vehicles parked right up to their driveway and they had visibility issues coming out because there's a lot of remodeling going on with the Smith building, so there's a lot of pickup trucks. And <coughs> it's been an ongoing issue that they've said for a few years now. So they're yeah, looking for like, some complaints for a long time. Looking for some solutions on that. And so we had initially in our first <coughs> proposal from last month said to um, extend no parking around the curve uh, further south, which would agree with parking. And and the residents prefer this? Um, from what I heard from the constituents that I talked to, they're happy with any change. <laughs> I, I mean, I only ask because, you know, you move the parking to the other side and now suddenly you have vehicles traveling closer to the houses mm -hmm. and they might like that even less. Maybe, as you said, we could try it as a temporary thing. I apologize, but I have to leave. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Three months or anything. Yeah, three months. They're not delineated in any way, right? They're not metered or anything like that. 
this is one of those um, areas that it, it's a very common complaint from the residents that people are parked right on top of their driveways. And um, people also park right on top of the, uh, there's a parking lot right at the back of uh, Cutter's Iskin, just as you turn off of Elm Street. And there's um, people parked on top of the entrance to that parking lot also causing problems. And so moving it over to the other side, because there are houses um, or this, as high a number of houses um, on that side, I, I think would really be beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, right, so there's no, there's really no residential on the other side. There's, there are Smith buildings and Smith parking lots, right? But there's, mm -hmm. right, there, there's relatively <coughs> small parking lots. Well, I noted last time, I think the line of sight of here is so the curb cuts on the opposite side are, are higher up as you enter any of the curb cuts on the westerly side of uh, Henshaw, you're going uphill. So that means when you're coming out, you're, you're, you have higher ground. So I think the visibility to get out into Henshaw makes it easier from that side. Mm -hmm. Whereas the easterly side is all sort of the same plane. Uh, and then the, the Cutter's just in parking lot, that's also the kitchen delivery mm -hmm. side. So when somebody restricts that curb mm -hmm. cut, it's, it's tight with the big trucks. I wonder about um, them getting in and out with a parked car across from that, but I, I think it's probably a, a, a less difficult situation. I, I think it would work pretty well, mm -hmm. but you never know. I don't think Smith is going to say anything. No. I don't think so. I imagine they get complaints from the residents as well. They do. Um, okay, any other thoughts on this? No, Gary, just spoke for Smith College. <laughs> 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 um, what do we think about trying this temporarily, or sh do we want to pass this ordinance on? So this would be an ordinance change, so it needs to go, we need, we need a recommendation from the council. So somebody would need to write the ordinance, right? Oh, and so I believe it's that written, something yeah. that, that, you, that we would take on? Because it has to do with where it starts and it's, stops. It's and written. It's yeah, written. we have okay. the... So then we just need to vote on that, recommend it or not. And then city council has to do it twice, I guess. Yes. Okay. Um, is there a motion on this ordinance? Motion to. I, I move that we vote to recommend this change. I'll second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Um, Aye. Any abstentions or no? Okay. Um, I think that we've covered everything. Am I correct? Yes. Does anybody have any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye.